literally we will not survive continuing to, to eat the way that we eat and farm the way that we farm. And in many ways, this is the natural world kind of saying, you know, shame on you, you know, learn from your mistakes, figure it out. And I also think that there was this moment too during the pandemic, I don't know if you remember at the beginning, all these news stories that were like, there's dolphins in Venice and there's so many more birds and people really starting to be like, oh wait, what I do impacts the natural world. And so I do think that there was that connection and there's been a ton of really interesting just polling coming out over the past few months. Um, Wonderman Thompson put out a, uh, a stat that was like 84% of Americans feel more appreciative of nature now than they did prior to the pandemic. So, um, you know, I do think that we're at this really, really exciting moment where we can leverage um, all of these different things to, again, kind of connect the dots. Eve Terrell Paul is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Eve is a globally recognized thought leader who focuses on the intersection of the digital age, food trends, and well-being. She is the author of Hungry, Avocado Toast, Instagram, Influencers, and Our Search for Connection and Meaning. Eve researches human behavior and the impact of the 21st century technologies and cultural events and examines how these shifts impact people's wants and needs all through the lens of food and lifestyle trends. With her unique blend of investigative reporting, analysis of academic research and top trends, Eve utilizes her extensive empirical research to advise Fortune 500 companies, startups, nonprofits, and independent entrepreneurs on how to connect and better serve people. She is also the founder of an executive director and executive director of the Food and Climate League, a nonprofit that's creating an exciting food and climate narrative to democratize sustainable eating. One other thing that was not in her bio is a book that maybe some of you have read as well. Her first book, this is not her, her first book. Her first book was A Taste of Generation Yum. Through interviews with a variety of millennials, roughly about 80 million in the U.S., as well as food luminaries, including Anthony Bourdain, Michael Pollan, Mark Bittman, Marianne Nestle, and more, Eve investigated the underlying drive for the millennial obsession with food and later looks at the role of millennials in the food future of food policy in America. Eve, welcome to the podcast. It's so good you're here. Thanks so much for having me, and thank you for that wonderful and thorough introduction. You're, you're most welcome. I am totally thrilled that uh, you're, you made the time to speak with me today. And I always struggle with the Generation Z and the millennials and reaching every, you're a millennial, you're a millennial mother and, and, a, and an author and very successful. Uh, and, and so I'm hoping to be enlightened myself. And I tell you, uh, this is your book and I read it twice and you're actually even so kind to mail me a signed copy. And I really thank you for that. Can't wait to get it here in Germany. It's hard to get those things. But in your biography, in this description of, of, of what how I introduce you, I know you've been doing this for about 10 plus years. Our paths have maybe crossed a, a few times. You've been at certain events or or speaking or doing things and, and with some of the same food foodies and food people and researchers uh, as me. But now I, I want to know, besides just talking about it, besides writing about it, has all this information, all this wisdom, all this preparation around food and seeing it under different lenses helped you prepare for all the craziness we just experienced? <laughs> oh, my God. Pandemic, Black Lives Matters, Asian racism, the inauguration. I could go on and on. We've just been through and we still are in some respects. Yeah going through crazy times, but as a, almost as a researcher, as an investigative journalist, as, as someone who has been researching, talking with the thought leaders, the influencers, finding out why we do what we do, 
did any of that you apply to your life and get some better business models or better operating systems on how to weather such crazy times better? Uh, uh, can you share with us how you've made it through? How have you gotten through this time? Well, I mean, first, I, I, I want to be honest with the fact that I think I have very much suffered through this period of time in many of the same ways that that others have. I lost two family members. I have been stuck, you know, at home most of the time. But Hungry specifically really started off with me doing research around human well-being and digging into all of these different theories, right? Because what I've been fascinated by for 10 plus years is why people choose to spend their discretionary time and income in certain ways. And when you really start prodding into that question, you have to go back to, well, what are our core basic needs? What needs are people trying to fulfill by spending $23 on avocado toast or going to goat yoga or doing sound bathing? Um, and so I started off my research for this most recent book by doing an evaluation of human well being theories. So I looked at um, theories coming from the realm of psychology, from neurobiology, from religious leaders. And it was super interesting when I overlapped all of them, kind of laid them out. I actually like did this on my floor of my condo. <laughs> um, saw that there really were three pillars that showed up. The first being our desire for control and safety. The second being our desire for community and belonging. And the third being our desire for purpose and meaning in life. And through that work, I was able to then identify how those desires have been showing up in food and lifestyle culture, especially over the last five or so years. Now, of course, it was riveting to watch uh, the COVID culture emerge, the Black Lives Matter culture emerge, to really see how, again, those core needs were being reflected in people's behaviors. But on a personal level, it did help me just manage my anxiety. You know, I recognized early on in the pandemic, okay, the, our lives right now are completely out of control, completely chaotic. What is it that I do have control over? I'm going to go to the grocery store and get a lot of dried goods and fill up my house with jars and jars and jars of dried beans, dried rice, you know, really just to make myself feel like, okay, no matter what happens, I'm going to be able to feed myself and feed my family. So that was like my way of kind of asserting order and control. In terms of community, it really was a reminder for me that I needed to continue FaceTiming um, as many of my close friends as possible to kind of keep that sense of community and connection. And also I reached out to my neighbors. You know, we're in this really bizarre time culturally, especially here in the United States, most people don't know their neighbors. And I was living in downtown Chicago, you know, in, a, in an apartment building that was just butting up on either side to, to my neighbors. I had never met them. And over the course of COVID, I got to know them really well and they became really great friends and we shared meals. And early on in the pandemic, I organized like a, a, a back porch beer hour with kids and a dance party. <laughs> um, and then in terms of purpose, the most fascinating work that I came across when really looking at what makes us feel fulfilled was just how intimately connected to nature we all are, whether we recognize it or not. And that we are physically and emotionally rewarded for spending time in nature. And so throughout this whole period of time, I have made it a point that every single day I go on a walk outside, you know, taking as many of my calls outside as possible, even if that meant walking around um, in my backyard, but I would, you know, take off my shoes and make sure my feet were sensing the grass and that I was pausing to just listen to the birds. Um, so all of these things did improve my well-being, I think, throughout the last year plus. Thank you so much for sharing that. I'm so sorry for your loss. It's, it's you know, it's been a hard time for everyone. Um, people have lost people, but we've also been through some extremely crazy times. So we're in, in this situation where there's a lot of dis-ease and uncertainties. And even before the pandemic, People were uncertain with certain elected officials, but also with governments and policies. They were just not very confident that the nations that they lived in, where they lived, that they were doing the right things for the future for them. And so there's, there is this, this angst, this anxiety and things where people are looking for other tribes, other social media, other places um, to kind of help them. 
And with that knowledge that you, you've gone through, not only the research, but just kind of about well-being, your search and, and, and what you learned around, around well-being, even though you had a hard time, were there maybe some other really good lessons or, or things that you said, boy, this really helped me besides the grounding, you going out into nature and walking, or maybe some examples of, of your neighbors where you say, wow, this is a better model to, to get through hard times and pandemics um, even more. And the, the, re the reason I ask you is because right now we don't see a lot of change in, 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 in all of those systems, those civilization frameworks or those well-beings that when the next pandemic comes that we maybe we'll have more social distancing. We won't wear a face mask. We'll wear a gas mask or an oxygen mask. It'll be a, it's a step up. It's not, I, I don't, and most people in the world don't see that it's going to get better. No, nope. next time we won't wear a mask. We won't get vaccines, you know? And so how, how do we deal that, prepare ourselves in, in different ways? I'm just looking for some, some tools and tips. And I think you've at least come across some ideas and some more that we could we could think about. And we'll go into more later as well, but I'd like to hear now what if you had any others. Yeah. So, you know, what gets me up in the morning is this understanding that the behaviors that we need to take on, and when it comes to food, um, in order to combat the climate crisis, those behaviors are inherently better for us physically and better for us mentally. And you've started to see that come to life over this past year. We feel better when we know who is growing our food, how our food is grown. When we feel connected to the people who are serving us food at a restaurant or in a grocery store, we feel better when we feel competent at creating something tangible. And you saw that with the sourdough bread boom. <laughs> we feel better when we feel connected to our communities. And I think the Black Lives Matter movement really jolted a lot of people into also recognizing community members that I think they've been ignoring and also gave an opportunity for people to voice their support of their neighbors and fellow citizens in a way that they hadn't before. And that in and of itself is fulfilling. To stand up for people's rights is fulfilling. And I do think that there is a really interesting cultural shift happening right now that I do hope maintains itself and grows so that when the next crisis like this happens, we have that resiliency built in, but that really focuses in on what's happening locally where you are. Getting reacquainted with nature, but with also your local food systems, getting reacquainted with your neighbors, your fellow members of humanity, really reminding yourself that we are legitimately all in this together and you as one person can make a difference for better or for worse that's going to impact people. And I think that part of the difficulty at the very beginning of this was just our blatant disconnect from all of those different concepts. It really took a while to feel, for people to feel ownership, to feel that sense of bonding and community, for people to feel that sense of control. Um, you know, I've heard just, just stories from family, friends, people who really have never spent much time outside thinking about the birds or even thinking about their black and brown neighbors who over this past year have found this real sense of purpose um, through just everyday things. And that has become a tool for their own resiliency. But I think that if we as a global society can build those things into our basic infrastructure of how we live, then we hopefully will not be dealing with at least the same levels of anxiety and depression and stress that we are right now. Um, you know, there is just something critical in knowing your neighbors and valuing human life and valuing the other living things around you. It really puts, it really puts things in perspective. Um, there's tons of, of really interesting literature as well about the appreciation of, of life whether it's a tree or it's another person who maybe doesn't look like you or talk like you. Um, but that can fill you with a feeling of awe and gratitude. And it has been studied over and over and over again to make us feel well. And so for me, it's just super exciting to see, well, okay, how do we get to that place? We need a more sustainable food culture. <laughs> um, how do we get to that place? We need a more socially just food culture. 
Um, and there's all of these really wonderful and beautiful opportunities in front of us that at the end of the day also translate into foods that are honestly more exciting and more delicious to eat. Um, more culturally relevant dishes, more ingredients from different places, more textures, more colors, more stories, um, more dinners together around the table. All of these really fun, exploratory, um, completely hedonistic uh, options before us that will will ultimately have all of these other um, kind of ripple out benefits. Thank you for sharing that. That is so beautiful. And and when I read your book, you really uh, at the end, closer to the end, you even give more examples of really in the conclusion, really some things you can do. But it, you take us on this nice journey. It's not written like an academic publication or a research report. It's really something that connects us with what's been going on recently and the trends and the research and what we're seeing. And, and, I, and I really love that. There, there are some questions that I want to know from you personally, but also maybe if you could tie in the research and what you've seen there uh, during this pandemic, this lockdown, we've had the social distancing. There's been this extreme nationalism that's kind of bubbled up and, and, and um, really tight borders because of the pandemic. We're not allowed to travel and, and things like that, but also some kind of blame and we're, we're, we're not open to pretty much everyone. And it's had ripple effects to uh, in the food industries and in, in food generally, how we eat, what's available and, and all sorts of things which create depression, whatever. The, the question really is, do you feel like a global citizen and how could you describe or feel or tell me how you would feel about a world without nations, borders, divisions of humans, one from another, and this extreme nationalism. Now, I, I wanna caveat that even a step further. During the pandemic, the lockdown, food was a global citizen. The pandemic was a global citizen. Species were a global citizen. Uh, food, water, air was global citizens. But humans, we weren't. We were like all of a sudden made to, you know, this person's the problem, that nation, whatever. And, and there was a lot of this separation. How do you feel about that trend or even glo even if you want to go more general about globalization and how does it tie to what you see in your research more especially to that, what you see online and what trends are and what things are people doing? Yeah, so it's a really deep question with a really complicated answer. So- I want it. <laughs> <laughs> there is a beautiful idea of a borderless, homogenous in some ways. Um, well, I shouldn't say homogenous because it really is more about uh, an acceptance and appreciation for the lack <laughs> of similarities uh, between us. There is this beautiful picture of that world that exists. But I do remain skeptical of that becoming a reality for a number of reasons based on what I found during my research for this book. So first, what comes to mind for me is an inherent desire within each of us to create order and sense of the world uh, again, this has been tested a number of different times. You can prime people even in conversation to think that there are things that are happening that are out of their control and they will start suddenly see shapes in a picture of fuzziness. They will suddenly think that they're, they need to take on more superstitious behaviors. Um, we are really primed when we're feeling anxious in any way to try to create something that is more black and white you know, separating the grays. And one way that we do that is by creating in-groups and out-groups, by saying, this is the community that I know that's familiar to me. I want to shut out or separate myself from the other, which is unfamiliar to me and therefore makes me feel more out of control. And that's something that we've seen even going back to hunter-gatherer times. I mean, that's tribes, right? You get to know your cohort, you know, it was up to a hundred people who you felt like you knew inside and out who were going to be there to have your back. Um, and the outside tribe was an unknown, which inherently makes us human beings feel anxious. And so I do think that there is something innate within us 
that utilizes that in-group out-group almost as a control and safety mechanism, which is pretty interesting when you when you really think about, well, if we just kind of accepted and loved the humanity in all of us, wouldn't that make us less anxious? Um, but the other part of this and the other reason why identity culture is so important is that it reduces the number of decisions that we have to make in a day, which is really important for our mental health and mental well-being. And it provides a structure and sense of self. And one of the things that's most apparent in food and lifestyle culture today is people searching for that sense of identity, people searching for their tribe. And we're living in this really interesting time in human history when we're less likely to be going to uh, houses of, of worship. We are actually less likely to be strongly politically affiliated. It doesn't feel like it, but there's more political independence now um, than in previous decades. We're less likely to know our neighbors, less likely to volunteer. Those kind of core assets that have provided that structure of stability and community support have evaporated, but we need them. We need them for our own well being. And so people are searching and saying, well, where are my people? Who am I? And, you know, in Hungary, I really look at how this is directly in relationship to the rise of interest in veganism, in the paleo diet. Right? I mean, these diets, they're not diets, they're lifestyles, they are philosophies, they are ways of being. It impacts the clothes that people wear and the schedules of their days. I mean, think about intermittent fasting. Um, with, the, with paleo and with veganism, there's a, there's a really strong philosophy about the things that we've gotten wrong in culture today. There's a lot of infighting as well within those, those tribes, which is also super, super interesting to research. I went to a vegan speed dating event and asked a few people there whether they would date a vegetarian. And it was like, it was like I had asked if they would date the devil. I mean, it was, the response was just so strong. Um, and the same thing when talking to researchers who look at paleo communities, that there's a lot of divisiveness between those who end up going down the keto route versus the whole 30 route and people saying, you know, you're wrong. But again, that's just further dividing these in groups, out groups. And I do think that there's something just innate in human nature that creates those divisions because it provides that sense of self and sense of control. And there is this really interesting movement right now. I do think we're at an inflection point where some of us are finding a sense of control and safety and actually viewing all of humanity as brothers and sisters who are in this together. And I do think that that is something that is developing. I certainly have started to feel that more strongly during this period of time. But then there's the other right route, which is people saying the world is completely out of control. Someone else is to blame. Uh, you know, I'm going to point my fingers. I want to close myself off. And that's where you're seeing really this push around um, mostly white nationalism that's happening. Um, all around the world and extremism, you know, different religious groups, again, saying, you know, we're the solution, you're the problem. And it, I'm going to be very interested to see how this plays out, but it does really feel like there's this massive divide that's starting right now of, of people kind of finding that sense of safety and control in two very different ways. I really appreciate you forming that way. And I might take you a little bit deeper if you don't mind. So there, there, um, I had I had Dr. Parag Kanan on on the show, and he wrote uh, sixteen plus books. But one of them was uh, our cartography type of a book, and looking at different maps, digital satellite maps, basically based off of satellite data, and uh, how we see how our world really functions. We we think it might be the map that we're used to seeing. But then when we look at the world at night, if we look at shipping and transportation, if we look at roads or, 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 or all different types of things from space, we get this different view of our world and how it works. And, and you touched upon something there that's nice, and I see it as well, and I've actually been seeing it for a long time, but um, I, I really feel it even stronger now. Um, I even had Sasha Sagan on the podcast. Her dad was Carl Sagan, the famous astronomer. And he, he uh, she wrote a fabulous book and he's a fabulous man, but he wrote um, a, a bunch of things, Cosmos and, and did a series on TV. But he had this, uh, this uh, um, kind of way of formulating things. And he says, there's this 
emerging consciousness that sees the earth as a single organism yeah. and an organism divided amongst itself is doomed or an organism at war with itself is doomed. Um, and the, we were not dropped. I'm, I'm in Hamburg, Germany now. You're, you're probably in Chicago. Uh, I was not dropped off here on in a spaceship from Germany. I, you were not dropped off on a spaceship to Chicago. Um, we crawled out of the primordial soup of this earth. We are earthlings. We come from this earth. And yes, we were born from our mothers, but we're, we're born from the earth. And so we are all kin. There's no, uh, uh, you know, we're, we all homo sapiens, which means wise men. And sometimes I, I question that. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, but but we, we're all kin. We're all uh, distant cousins and related to some extent, but we're, we're kind of struggling against one each other in, in these tribes or cliques. And and you you research not only the psychology and the data and the things behind it or kind of the well-being of that i i just want to see is there really um in the psychology of well-being where you see that humanity says well people in asia and germany and in the u.s we're all the same kin and uh that there's this emerging maybe might put us into better balance or do you still see that as a divisive factor that's going to continue this divide that you spoke about or or do you see some more hope or optimism that that's also emerging that realization of humanity no matter what age so that's a great question you're reminding me of a, a life satisfaction index that i'm going to find when we get off this call that asks uh, in the survey you know, a question about, do you feel a, a part and among humanity? And one of the things that I've been really intrigued by since finishing Hungry is this question of how do we guide people towards a more sustainable food movement in large part because it satisfies all of these needs and, you know, saves the planet for humanity. Um, but part of that to me is also about allowing people the opportunity to recognize that we are made from the earth there isn't a division between us and the soil. Every single thing that you consume is made up of nutrients that were once in the ground. Whether that was consuming an animal that then consumed something that was in the ground, you, your existence, every single one of us, our existence is fueled by the nutrients in the dirt beneath our feet. And that disconnect is causing, I think, a lot of this sense of unrootedness, lack of, lack of uh, um, sense of place and self. And while I do believe that the internet has caused a lot of problems for us, which we haven't really dug into quite yet, um, you know, the digital age does also provide this unique opportunity for us to see humanity as one. And I do think that this global pandemic was a really interesting moment for us when we could really observe the lack of border, right? What you were saying, that the, the virus itself is a global citizen. That, you know, with the climate crisis, people are starting to understand that the air is a global citizen and the water and the birds and the dolphins and, you know, whatever else that surrounds us. And I do think that there is opportunity for us to create the in-group of people on earth and the out group as people off of earth. And that seems kind of radical and wild right now, I think for a lot of people, because the existence of things off of earth just seems so unknown, but we need to create, so I'm, I'm a huge nerd about all this stuff. So I'm gonna use the term collective effervescence, which is a Durkheim theory. Um, so collective effervescence is like that feeling that bubbles up in you when you're like at a Beyonce concert or at a sports game, right? Where you just like feel this kinship with the people around you. Um, you know, I think that's kind of been facilitated over the last few years at communal dining tables or immersive experiences or escape the room events, right? We need a global collective effervescence of feeling that sense of bubbling support and love for one another that will encourage people to band together and also feel a sense of personal responsibility to do the right thing for one another and for planet earth. Um, 
But I do, there's, you know, this kind of like interesting psychological trick that I do believe has to be played where there has to still be an out group in order for that collective effervescence, <clears throat> excuse me, in order for that collective effervescence to really coalesce and percolate among us, if that makes sense to you. Oh, it totally makes sense. I, and, and it's so interesting, you know, I've, I've definitely heard, you know, collective intelligence, collective energy, when you're in such large groups, when you're around big tables, that you just feel alive, this energy, this excitement, and, uh, and, uh, and also in hard times, you feel um, sadness and, and, and anxiety and things can, uh, uh, fear can emerge as well. Um, so I, I appreciate you kind of giving us that bigger global uh, aspect, that view of, of how we work. I think that cultures and diversity and uh, people of color and all those different tribes or cultures that maybe sometimes would see as divisional or uh, uh, separating us somehow or making us make a choice in one way are, are good. They're, they take humanity to certain levels. But there is a much bigger one, the one that we all crawled out of the same earth and we're all related kin. Um, and we all, all basically walked out of the plains of Savannah and, 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 uh, and Africa's and, um, <clears throat> and have evolved to this point where we are today um, and with many other, other things. There's always um, a lot of talk in our area as well around food, indigenous wisdoms and cultures and how we need to respect them absolutely we absolutely need need to respect them and those those uh, atrocities that have occurred over the decades over the millennia where we've actually used food uh clear back to and even before gandhi where uh the colonialism was using food as a way to hurt people to hurt groups in the, in the united states we did that a lot with the Native Americans and Buffalo and, and many, many stories like that where food can be used as such a beautiful, powerful connector, but then it can also be used as a form of control. And as you get into your book, as you start out, you have this nice flow on how it goes. And I, I really like that. So it's control, it's belonging, and it's purpose. And this belonging is is really that community you kind of are speaking about as, as well. And, um, but it, it's not, not just the food culture and this well being, but it's tying it into today and age. We're in the digital age and we've got smartphones and we take selfies and TikTok and all these different things that are also an added layer of, uh, uh, of how we eat, how we interact with food, how we see food, how we understand it. Um, what are the ways that we can be sustainably eating? How are you creating with this food for climate league kind of some of the tools that take us into some better models to, that you're working on to teach us to eat different, to, to think about it different. And, and what, what are your hopes? Maybe you can tease us about some of your projects that you're currently working on. Yeah, well, first, thank you for the question. I also, as you were speaking, I was just thinking about how great a metaphor agriculture is for just humanity, right? We went from this point of being wild to now row crops and deciding that there's really a certain few things that we should be focusing on. We're gonna line them up, we're gonna make them pretty and we're gonna try to run the world that way. Well, guess what? It doesn't work and so now there's this movement of rewilding that I'm so excited about. Um, you know, and there's- Matter of fact, uh, I just, sorry, I'm gonna pull up a book here about that same thing, the, the, the wild terrian diet and, the, oh, cool. and the, the, yeah, but also the, the rewilding and the carbon farming, and there's so many things, regenerative agriculture and permaculture that are just emerging. I have tons of books here. Yeah. Um, going back from old to new that all just talk about those things. And, and that is where we need to go. That's where we were. Yeah. And I doesn't need to go back to the roots. It can be done in a modern way, yeah. but we've disconnected ourselves from nature and how food grows and it's hurting the biome, our soil, our, our waterways, and that's hurting the biome of our guts and our microbes and our bodies making us unhealthy. Yeah. I mean, literally we will not survive continuing 
to, to eat the way that we eat and farm the way that we farm. And in many ways, this is the natural world kind of saying, you know, shame on you, you know, learn from your mistakes, figure it out. And I also think that there was this moment too during the pandemic. I don't know if you remember at the beginning, all these news stories that were like, there's dolphins in Venice and there's so many more birds and people really starting to be like, oh wait, what I do impacts the natural world. And so I do think that there was that connection and there's been a ton of really interesting just polling coming out over the past few months. Um, Wonderman Thompson put out a, uh, a stat that was like 84% of Americans feel more appreciative of nature now than they did prior to the pandemic. So, um, you know, I do think that we're at this really, really exciting moment where we can leverage um, all of these different things to, again, kind of connect the dots. Um, so I'll go back to, to your question about Food for Climate League and what it is that, that we are working on. Um, I mean, there, there was even another question, if you don't mind, if we could yeah. come back to that in just a second. And so it's, it's because you just touch upon it, it's, it's so right. There's this, we feel like, you know, because we see those nature things and that we're, we're now connected but there's also this flip side, and maybe you can touch upon this as well. And, uh, and when we talk more about the book and, and what your research found, or even moving forward with uh, the uh, Food for Climate League. But when you're overweight, or when you're unhealthy, or when you're eating the wrong types of food, there's this form of desensitization or numbing where you can't even feel or sense or hear or see the outside world, whether it's natural or not that because you're in pain or you're depressed or or whatever else where you can't even do that and so if you're healthy if you're if you're eating the right things if you don't know where they come from there's this just this innate connection to our kin to a, to the nature and that and um i used i used to be fat i used to be a fat big fat guy overweight and I was really numb. I, if somebody says, Mark, you're going to be environmentalist and activist and, and do all these things, uh, never would have believed it in a million years because I was numb. I couldn't feel and sense the outside world. I was so caught up in my own body. And I'm sure many people are feeling that same thing, but it's a wicked spiral to get out of. And maybe, I don't know if that's taking you down the wrong path, but I just oh. see that connection there to, to what you, you were just mentioning. I was just if there's, you know, if you want to come back to that later, that's fine as well. No, I'm on just making notes so I don't forget what I was going to say. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Go, no, I'm sorry. No, no, no. This is good. There's a, I mean, there's a lot of just like rich, rich content in here. And thank you for these great questions. So I would love to start with talking about the impact of the digital age and kind of how we've gotten here. Because I do think that that, you know, we're talking about the industrialized global food system. and the addiction of sugar, salt, and fat, and the racial and social injustice of our food system. But there is a new addiction that was presented to us around 2007, and that comes in the form of an iPhone. And yes, <laughs> again, the iPhone debuted in 2007. Instagram came out in 2010. That was not that long ago. And think about how drastically your life has changed. It's not just food culture. It's the way we interact with family and friends. It's the way that we evaluate our self-worth. It's how we literally spend our waking hours of life. Um, there was some really disturbing data that I uncovered during the research for Hungry about the number of years that we are going to be spending on social media. That if you take the, the hours that especially <clears throat> millennials and Gen Zers spend on these, these networking sites right now, and you extrapolate that over the, a lifetime, it's years of our lives spent liking and upvoting things. And, you know, we were just talking about this notion of appreciation for humanity and rewilding versus the desire for order and rose. And a capitalistic meritocracy, which is what so much of the world is now moving towards or is, is fully in, really pushes towards the individual, right? All of the attention goes to your SAT scores and the grades that you're getting and whether you've got the corner office and whatever accolades you personally um, are, are kind of collecting along the way. And the internet has just exacerbated this. Make your profile, right? Make your profile to present yourself four different ways on four different social media platforms, you know, be artistic on Instagram, be, you know, funny and witty on Facebook, 
be sarcastic on Twitter and be super professional and impress, you know, impressive on, on LinkedIn. Um, and who cares what you're actually like, you know, as long as your posts are getting kind of the upvotes that, that you need in order to get the job and, and get that sense of fulfillment. Now, much of Hungry is actually just going through all the reasons why this kind of relationship is really bad for our well-being and exacerbating rates of loneliness and stress and anxiety and depression guess what? We already had a loneliness epidemic prior to COVID. And now we are in a really dire situation. The CDC has said that 40% of Americans are now expressing symptoms of true intense anxiety and depression. Over the summer, they came out with data that said that 25% of the, I think it was 18 to 25 year olds that they had interviewed. And this is the CDC, right? Doing like a phone interview, I think. 25% um, had said they'd contemplated killing themselves this year. I mean, this is, we are really at a moment when we need a new way of living. We need to be embracing something that is different than the reality we've created for ourselves. And a lot of these technologies ping our evolutionary brain in much the same way that a bag of Doritos or a Snicker bar does. It's taking advantage of the way that our minds evolved, but then putting us in an entirely different situation. So we feel really good when we get a like, but guess what? You feel much better when you have eye to eye contact and hug somebody. Um, and that like, that hit of dopamine you get from that like, it dissipates really quickly. And then you end up just feeling envious and jealous and horrible about yourself most of the time when you're using social media. Um, there's all of these things that we're, do we're doing that are really destructive to our sense of self. And along the way, um, we really need to be shifting the way that we are relating to one another, um, taking that online experience and somehow putting it aside or reusing it, in, you know, finding a new way to use it to really coalesce. And I think that happened with the Black Lives Matter movement. I think that has happened um, at the beginning of the pandemic, where instead of using the internet to gloat about things that, to be honest, no one really cares about, <laughs> um, you know, whatever you ate for dinner or, uh, you know, whatever witty thing that you said, people are going to forget about it in two seconds. Um, instead, we used it to organize marches in the streets. We've used it to provide tips on here's how you use whatever's left over in your fridge. So you don't have to go to the grocery store again. Here's where you find a local farmer's market. Here's you know, some tips for things that you can do with your kids outside. We actually use these platforms to better our well-being for, I would say, the first time ever. <laughs> um, and I'll be really interested to see what the, what the data um, says coming, coming out of this. Um, and now I need to think about, I'm going to pause for one second because I need to think about what the other point was that I was going to make and I was going to draw this to something else that is now slipping away. Remind right. me the original question. Well, just how are we become desensitized as well. That was when I interrupted and interjected to you um, <clears throat> that when we're eating the wrong foods, when we're overweight, uh, it creates a desensitization, a numbing of us that we can't even really feel the outside world. We're not connected to the nature and, or, yeah. or if that was one. one. Yeah. But I mean, in what you brought up as well, there's uh, new data coming out that I'm hearing is a lot of people don't want to return to the way that they were living, return to the way that they were working. They're now happy and more comfortable and how they've been interacting with their daily lives and being at home and finding a new lifestyle choice. And that's what I loved about your book and how you said this in the beginning. It's really about creating a lifestyle that we want that's worthy of us and, and where we're going to go and, and, and not nine to five and soulless type of a living. Yeah, I remember what I was going to say. <laughs> so you were talking about that sense of, of feeling numb. And a lot of this really comes down to the fact that so many of us are suffering emotionally. Um, I recently learned that Maslow's hierarchy of needs, uh, which is what I use a lot in the book as a reference, was inspired by an indigenous pyramid of needs that looks very different. So in Maslow's hierarchy, you have food, water, shelter at the bottom, you have this desire for family and support and building of self-esteem. And then at the top, you have self-actualization, becoming your ultimate self. So it turns out that Maslow had spent time 
with a, a native tribe in the US and they had their own hierarchy, which actually had self-actualization as the first step. Because in that model, the tribe was already providing all of those other rungs of Maslow's hierarchy. From the get-go, when you were born, you had a sense of safety, you had shelter, you had food, you had a community, you had a sense of self and belonging and purpose. And the first step of the hierarchy was the tribe helping you become all that you could be. And then it was figuring out how does that help propel and support your community? And then how do you pass that down to future generations, right? We are right now feeling completely caught <clears throat> by focusing in on how can I just survive, right? How, like you can't, even when you're numb like that, you can't feel connected to the outside world. You can't feel connected to others. And so much of this is being perpetuated by the digital worlds that we are living in. And listen, the, the thing that I'm really excited about again is that sustainable food culture and a lot of these trends that we are seeing over the past year are breaking down those habits and barriers. We've also seen how quickly people can change their habits and behaviors, right? If you have a moment of disruption, guess what? We figure it out. We develop you know, new ways of doing things, new foods to eat, new habits, new, new, new places to work, um, new ways of, of interacting with one another. And part of what we're doing at Food for Climate League is actually saying, well, okay, this is a really beautiful idea of the whole world moving in this sustainable direction, but we're dealing with record high rates, again, of anxiety, of loneliness, of depression, of stress. People are so unbelievably overwhelmed. They're unhealthy on a physical level as well. How do we present sustainable food culture as something that seems less altruistic and, and of, you know, about self-actualization and more about helping you reconnect with yourself, unnumb yourself. Um, and that might be about affordable foods. It might be about immune boosting foods. It might be foods that are helping you celebrate your cultural heritage and diversity. There's an amazing plant-based food movement happening right now in the African-American community that I am inspired by on a daily basis that I think is super exciting that's about celebrating culture. And guess what? It just happens to have plants in the center of it because for most of humanity, that's what we've eaten and been really satisfied by. So at Food for Climate League, we're really investigating ways of talking about sustainable food culture that can resonate with people who are in that moment of just, oh my gosh, I need some control over my life, over my health, over my mental health. Um, talking to people who feel disconnected from the world around them, be it their neighbors or their family or the soil underneath their feet. And then, you know, also contributing to the narrative of purpose, though that narrative is, is pretty well developed out there, right? Um, most food and lifestyle brands are saying, you know, here's how you do good in the world by, by eating sustainably. So what we're really investigating is, well, how do we talk to the rest of humanity? Because the reality is, there aren't there many of us who are ready to give up something in order to do something for the common good. And that message is just not going to resonate with that many people. That is so beautiful. And, and I use Maslow's hierarchy of needs a, a lot. And I, I also knew about that as well. We, uh, you, uh, you might know I'm a sustainable development goal advocate. And so I truly believe the Paris agreement and the sustainable development goals are a roadmap, a plan of action, targets, indicators, and goals that really can get us to uh, keep, keep our planet below 1.5 degrees of warming, but as a better operating system for us to move towards for a nicer future come December 2030. Um, we need, we're all feeling this dis, dis ease, this unrest with societal and cultural and, and political areas. And that's why we're kind of grasping for some more control. We're, we're, we're looking at it for it in technology, but then we're also going offline and saying, how can we grow our own food? Uh, Ron Finley from, from uh, California says, growing your own food is like printing your own money. But even further, you, you kind of said it so nicely, connecting ourselves with food, growing our own food or having that reconnection is a sense of control. It's a sense of resilience and security where you say, hey, my basic needs are net, met. I know where it's coming from. I know how to do it. Um, I'm, I'm going to be okay. 
because I have the basics met. And then once I have the basics met or my family has the basics met, now I can go to my community and uh, add more value to and have that identity, that self-actualization. And, and sometimes that, that, we, that, that transformation or that um, enlightenment, uh, uh, Maslow's pyramid on the, on the top is also um, there a few steps before is this rite of passage that uh, adults and youth and, and that transition into adulthood or experience their form of how do you connect with that community? How do you, how do you find your purpose and your place in life? And, and in your book, you talk, you mentioned that, and you, you kind of talk about those things as well, but how sometimes belonging in your diets and your identity are, are formulated. What you eat is part of your identity and what tribe you belong to is part of your identity and that we share our experiences with one another. Um, but, and maybe you have a, a, an answer for this. What do we really need to feel well? Well, I mean, <laughs> it, it, is, it is those three core, core pillars, you know, and those come to life in different ways for different people. Um, but, you know, something that I really love about this concept of, of gardening is that it actually hits on all of our core human needs. So it provides a sense of control because you're learning a new skill. You are growing things for yourself, providing for yourself, but there's also a sense of community that's created both between you and the people that you actually feed or work with uh, to, to create that food, but also a sense of community with the land itself. That's really satisfying, right? Seeing that you are feeding the soil and the soil is giving back to you to feed you. Um, and then there's the feeling of purpose of you feeding others or taking care of the soil. If you are actually leaving the earth better than the way that you found it. Um, and again, building skills, learning something new. That's very much about um, creating a sense of purpose, having a tangible output. A lot of the time in the book is also spent talking about, you know, why a PowerPoint presentation is just not viscerally as satisfying as making a loaf of sourdough bread um, or, or growing a cucumber. There's, it's hardwired within us. We want something that we can see and feel and taste and touch and physically share with others. And I do think that there is this kind of notion within our society right now that it is a rite of passage into adulthood to do these things. But I gotta tell you, my daughter's 20 months. She really loves to garden. She really loves to feed people. She really likes to help people when they're feeling down. And I think that there's no reason why we should have to wait until uh, we've achieved all these different things to really find that sense of, of purpose and meaning. I do think you need to be, be providing control and community along the way, but they can be tied together. And you know, something that's also really beautiful in all of this is you know, a sense of, of Leah Penniman often talks about food sovereignty. Um, but that's also about a sense of control. It's also about a sense of community. It's also about a sense of purpose. Um, and it's also creating a more sustainable, vibrant world. So again, I mean, there's a lot in life that can get us down right now, but I am consistently on a daily basis inspired by the fact that there is a really simple, beautiful, Instagram worthy, delicious solution for our physical and mental well-being as well as the planet's well-being. And that's what I'm so excited about. And you know, really when you look at the SDGs, they are inspiring a whole host of people, right, to take action. I also think that there's limitations to the way that they've been presented. I think that it's all it's speaking to the choir, right? It is motivating the people who need to be motivated. But there's also ways of presenting a lot of these goals in a way that will make someone think, "Oh, I want to do that on, you know, in my kitchen or with my kids, or maybe that's a way of reframing um, something we're talking about at church or the way that I am interacting with my kids. There's ways of, of really drawing the lines between the, the sustainability goals that, that industry and people kind of in our world um, are talking about these things. They resonate with the masses. We're just not talking about it the right way. It's a communication as a, as a big key I'm really excited for the uh, Food for Climate League and what you're 
kind of hoping to do there and, and moving towards and that you've created this. And I, I know you're working with some other greats and, and you're surrounded by great people, but it's just to provide no brainers, uh, good ways for us to eat sustainable and to, to, to make it uh, um, a, a much better option for our world and to help us, you know, to move forward in that guise of, of, um, of doing that. I, I also want to know, because we're at a pin pinnacle time, not only is it the craziest of times, but it's also the, the biggest bubbling up and uh, organizations, communities coming together to solve those problems. The UN was supposed to launch the uh, UN Food Systems Summit in 2020, but because of the pandemic, it's been moved to this year. Uh, the pre-summit is in uh, July in Rome uh, at the FAO, um, Future Food Institute, with uh, our, our mutual friend and colleague, Sarah Reversi, is involved in that, and, and she will be there. You've, you've done uh, your kind of a book club videos with the Future Food Institute and, and presented that as well. But are you involved in this uh, uh, UN Food System Summit? And I, I guess in New York in, in September, they'll have the actual Food System Summit there. And there's a lot of action groups and, and things there that are talking about all different aspects of the complex food system. I have to be honest with you. I think your voice is missing the the research, the data, the 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 things that we need in, in that aspect are really failing. And so I'd love to have you invite you, but also have you be on board. But are you doing anything with that already? It's a very good question. Uh, so first, I would also like to plug Sara Reversi and say that Future Food Institute was our founding partner for Food for Climate League. So we are, we exist because of their support. We still exist because of their support. They kind of incubated us, provided us with the team members um, and intelligence. And um, anyway, they've just been an amazing support system. So so props to Sara, who has her finger, I feel like, in, in everything. Everything. <laughs> She's world. everywhere. She's yeah. everywhere. I don't know when she sleeps. Um, I don't think she does. <laughs> <laughs> um, we are not intimately involved in the UN Food System Summit. We've been trying to find a way to, to get involved. We've proposed a number of different uh, ideas to people who are directly involved. We do think that our voice um, and our perspective is important. Um, we would love to be providing trainings to people who are speaking even to help them reframe uh, the way that they're talking about this. We would love to, to have a platform uh, to talk about the opportunities really that, that are before us and really kind of paint this picture, not just of something dire, but of something beautiful um, that we can really grasp onto. Um, you know, it, it, was a, it was a dream of ours to do some original research to be able to present by that, that period of time. That opportunity is still there. We're looking for the funding right now. If anyone's interested in supporting Food for Climate League and our research, we are eager to get more collaborators and sponsors and just like-minded, passionate people on board so we can further our mission. Um, but we would love to plug in uh, to, to the UN Food System Summit um, and all of the great work that, that's happening there to really just ensure that these messages don't remain niche and become more palatable and more accessible to the general public. Because at the end of the day, that's what we need. We need to get people jazzed about these ways of eating and see it as something that's affordable, that's Instagram worthy, that's immune boosting, um, that is socially just. I, I definitely know you will have some opportunities to do that. And it is really for everyone. So not only can anyone get involved in the five action tracks and the food systems dialogues and create their own dialogues, there's some set templates and guidance on how to do that and do it on a community local level, as well as on that national and international stage. And, and Sarah is probably the perfect partner to help you, um, whether it's the pre-summit or some others, She's plugged into that system as one of the champions as part of that as well, as well as many other people that uh, you're associated with and affiliated with. Um, I know Sophie Egan is somehow also uh, connected director with you. Strategy. Yes. Yeah, director of strategy. And she she's done some things for the EAT Foundation, the EAT Forum, which is a big forum. They're also plugged into the UN Food System Summit. So we just need to pull on some of those guys' ears and, and make sure that 
you have your seat at the table as well as anybody else. We're all invited to have our voice at the table, especially if we 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 have a message, if we can communicate it, if we are not just shouting or or, or, or being mean or, or or but if we have something that oh this could help everyone, could help all humanity to get a step further to a better food system, one that stops human suffering and dis-ease of humanity and solves our climate problems in, in many different ways. Um, so, and I'll make sure to, to push that as well, but I'm sure regardless of that, you're going to continue your message and your work. And I, I expect to see beautiful, wonderful things coming from you a lot. In your book, you, you, you use... Not, everyday terms and knowledge but it's it's something some things that we might not have always heard and you explain them so nomophobia <laughs> for me I, I guess i'm too much of a grandpa I, uh, it's yeah. basically it's a no phone phobia if i understand it correct yeah it's the fear of not having or not being able to use your smartphone um, and there's there's actually a push right now to get it entered into the DSM so that psychiatrists, psychologists can formally diagnose patients with this. So this is, uh, Mark, you might not feel this if you're not terribly attached to your devices, but most people do feel nomophobia. So it's a sense of panic that can set in when your battery bar goes red or when you realize you've left the house without your phone. Uh, it's people really feeling like it's an appendage that they can't live without. I, when I was younger, I used to feel that way if I left the house without my watch. Yeah, there you go. But yeah. but, I, but I've never felt that with my smartphone, um, although it is very hard because nowadays everything you do on there, you can rent cars with your phone, you know, and, and, and yeah, what I if agree. you lose your charge, then <laughs> the car you rent all of a sudden dies. I don't know what happened. But then there's also, so um, do it yourself, DIY, which everybody kind of knows, but this Euda ammonia, eudaimonia, eudaimonia, which is human flourishing, if I understand, and yeah. um, that that's really what what sparks me is because um, it, it, in the conclusion of your book, you kind of you you give us a synopsis of some tools, some things that are available, some opt very bright optimism of where we're going and how we can grab control of this and solve it. Um, but you talk about human nature and human flourishing and uh, uh, not to go too far into doom and gloom. Do we have a human condition or a human nature that drives us in this addiction or these negative things? Or is do we have this more human flourishing direction that we can go? So this goes back to your comment about homo sapiens <laughs> and the definition of being wise men. Um, I don't think that we're very wise. I do think that that greed and um, self-care and self-interest are deeply embedded into us. Um, I do think that there is, though, the opportunity for a counterculture. And I do think that that native tribes provide that alternative narrative, right? Saying, if you are born into a position in which you don't feel like you need to fend for yourself, when you don't feel like you're out for yourself, then we can thrive, in fact, thrive to a whole new degree. Um, and so I do think that there is a, a opportunity to kind of remake culture with community at the center. That is fulfilling those other core needs so that the greed, the self-interest is not even something that people are really thinking about because there's no need to be greedy, right? You, you are provided for. Uh, there's no need to be self-interested. In fact, if you are, maybe you're gonna get kicked out of your tribe and that's gonna be a real problem for you. <laughs> Um, so, you know, there are these, there's a multitude of ways of existing and being in the world and a multitude of philosophies, but one that has lived on, right, are these indigenous tribal cultures. And there's a reason. There's a reason why they've been around for so long, why a lot of these tribes are still thriving if they can keep these Western ideas out. Um, you know, that's really the challenge for a lot of them. Um, and I don't mean to, to paint, you know, a picture of utopia, right? There's still suffering. There's still problems even within those indigenous cultures. But guess what? There's a lot of problems and a lot of suffering and some major issues uh, that need to be solved. Um, again, we are not flourishing right now, um, you know, on a personal level. 
on a physical level, on an emotional level, we are not flourishing. Uh, when it comes to the way that we treat our environment, our planet is not flourishing. Um, and there are plenty of people who will say, you know, the world is, is safer and more peaceful now than it was in, in past times. And, and maybe, maybe that's true. Um, but I also think that because of the technologies, especially that, that we've developed, we are more fearful. We are more anxious. And maybe there were kind of horrible things that were happening, but we didn't know about most of it. We knew about what was happening, you know, in our immediate tribe. We were not taking in the horrors and the ills of the entire world, um, which also are kind of, you know, further pushing us towards this, this mentality of self-interest because the world feels so dangerous right now. Um, but I do think that there is the opportunity using these same technologies, in fact, to cultivate that sense of interconnectedness um, with one another, with the earth. Um, and so I do think that there is an uplifting ending that is possible. And if I didn't believe that, I wouldn't be doing this work. Um, you know, there's certainly days where I, where, especially if I'm, if I'm watching too much news about politics, I, I start to feel the other way. Um, and I need, I need a reminder. Um, but no, I do think that, that when, if we follow the path to human flourishing, we will be doing the right thing for us and for the planet. In your book, there's a lot of, you know, obviously psychology, sociology, um, captivating investigative reporting, but it's also, you, you, if you go to your website, a lot of the things that you've done and you consult clients with, there's some tools. The study is actually downloadable and you can go in and dive, take a deeper dive into the information, which is kind of tickled upon in the book. Okay, we don't want to be bored by a, a bunch of research stats and data, but um, should you want to have that deeper dive, there are some tools and that stuff on your website. And I'll put that in the show notes and description um, that people can take those deeper dives. And also to, to the uh, food uh, for climate league so that they can find out more about that. I'll put all those links in the show notes or descriptions. Tell me if we've left anything out specifically about the book that we still need to address because I have one and you're probably the last really, really hard, hard question that's gonna, uh, <laughs> uh, that uh, smoke's gonna come out yours. No, I'm just kidding, okay. you've, you've got this. Uh, uh, and, and then three other questions for my listeners, but I wanna make sure that we've covered everything um, that you'd like to let us know. Yeah, I mean, just kind of you reminded me. There, so in conjunction with the Hungry book, I did run an original study with Data Essential. It's available for purchase. You can download the executive summary for free on, online. Um, it's a 75 page report that really digs deep into the way that technology impacts people emotionally, but then how that shows up in food culture. And the reason, and, and also our relationship with nature, our interest in DIY um, activities. The reason why I did this is because I've been doing you know, research as a journalist essentially as a you know creative nonfiction writer for 10 years which mainly is interviews shadowing evaluating a lot of academic literature reading other people's work coalescing all of that together but I developed a lot of these theories about human behavior and how all of these different threads were interconnected and I reached out to Jack Lees the CEO of Data Central and said can I test this <laughs> Can we run a survey? And thank goodness he said yes. So we surveyed 1,100 people across the United States, um, asking them these questions about their food behaviors, but also their anxieties, their sense of connection to their community, their obsessions with influencers, um, and the number of wild plants they can identify in nature, the number of hours they spend out outdoors all day. And we found some really, really interesting insights as it relates to restrictive diets and levels of anxiety, attitudes towards GMOs, um, the, the connections as well between people who are eating foods at their desk um, and connection to technology, as well as, you know, we found, it, we found one group of people who were closer to reaching eudaimonia. And I'm gonna leave it as a cliffhanger as to who, what group of people those were. <laughs> um, so oh, yeah, that's I, I great. that's the only part. 
That's great. You you also took some notes when I interrupted you. Did we get to cover those? Did you answer those? Okay, great. I just don't, didn't want to be rude and, and interrupt you on that. The hardest question I have for you today is the burning question, WTF. And it's not the swear word like you're probably thinking. Although maybe during this crazy time, you've said it a few times, pulling out your hair when your child was not around, I hope. Um, it's the question, what's the futures? And I don't want to know for someone else or the German politicians or the U.S. government, what's the futures? Where are we going? To give us the roadmap. What do we have to look forward to? Well, I mean, I think that there is a need to understand that at our core, we are all motivated by those three human desires, right? And that's just not, that's not going to change. And so what, what does change is the environment and how well that's being fulfilled by the societal structures that we've developed. So in the immediate future, uh, I think without question, right, you're going to see kind of the food trends of, of immune boosting foods. I think the number of eating disorders has unfortunately skyrocketed this past year as people have been searching for that desire for control, which also means that interest in restrictive diets like gluten-free, soy-free, sugar-free, what have you, um, is, is also going to probably continue on. We're going to see probably a lot of nutty, interesting, different ways of eating that, that will emerge uh, with people trying to create that sense of, of order. Um, I do think that, that restaurant culture is going to come back really strongly. You know, at the beginning of all of this, people were saying that restaurant culture was over. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Right? Think the foodie movement was born out of the 2008 recession. That was when people didn't have money, but right, it started with food trucks. And we want to invest in experiences that make us feel good. And restaurants can provide that place for also community bonding. And I think when it's paired with the racial justice movement, this greater interest in, in local talent and local flavors, um, which I do think is happening. I think it's really this moment that, that restaurant culture should be building on and taking advantage of and allowing people to celebrate, to connect um, in this whole new way. And I do believe that people, people are starting to understand that you as an individual can have a legitimate impact on the outcome of our, of our world, of our health and safety. And I, you know, I'm heartened by the fact that interest in climate activism has gone up over this past year. I think for a lot of people, they're like, oh, this is what a global crisis <laughs> looks like. And this might just be a very tame version of what's to come. Uh, but I also think that there's been a really clear line drawn for people of, you know, if you take responsibility, here are all the people that you can protect. If you don't take responsibility, here are all the people you can infect. Um, and I think that that has in many ways created a sense of empowerment for a lot of people that can be leveraged. And in terms of, you know, where we go in the future, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm no more, uh, 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 what do they call it, a soothsayer? <laughs> um, I, I can, you know, I can't say where exactly we are heading, but I do think that we are at this really pivotal moment in humanity where we are going to have to decide, are we going to be seeing each other as equals, as valuable people who deserve food and nutrition and shelter and love and respect uh, of equal amounts, no matter the situation you were born into, or are we a species that just wants to self-protect by surrounding ourselves with people who look and sound and eat things that are familiar to us? And I do think that that is going to determine how long homo sapiens are around. Um, and this is, <laughs> you know, it's, we, we are at a really pivotal moment in, in, the story of, of humanity. And I hope that I'm not leaving people with a sense of dread um, because the reality is a lot of what's happened over this past year has been really uplifting. People are taking on sustainable behaviors. They are standing up for people's rights. They're marching in the streets. And I think that we are by and large on the right path, but it's going to take conviction and it's going to take passion and it's going to take excitement and it's going to take um, all of us, especially us within this industry, creating a new narrative to invite people into this movement as stakeholders. 
and make sure that we're not the only ones who feel empowered, that everybody feels empowered to make these changes for themselves and their community. I'm, well, first of all, ding, 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 you got the answer right. You, you got it right. So correct. No, actually, that's one of the best answers I've received in a long time. I ask all my guests that. And for me, what's the future is, what's the plan? What's the roadmap? Where are we going? How are we going to get there? And, you know, if a ship doesn't have a course, a plan, it's never going to get there. It's just going to drift around. And I really like the, the wisdoms that you gave us. I think they're, they're wonderful. And it's not too much doom and gloom. There's a lot of optimism in there. And I think we can do it. And the tools are there. The things are in your book. I, I, I think I want to throw another hard question in there for you. It's not too hard. It's very similar to the one I just asked, but maybe you could give a little bit shorter answer, even if this is possible. What does a world that works for everyone look like for you? Oh, it looks like for me personally? Yeah. That's a good question. I think it takes it's a hard a one. Time. It's a hard one. I think that I would be living in and amongst a stronger community. I think I would know my neighbors. I think I would be eating entirely with the seasons unless there was something to celebrate in which I wanted to pay a lot for a pineapple flown in from someplace. Um, I think that I would be surrounded by people of all different age groups and races and backgrounds. And so would my daughter and she wouldn't think anything of it. I'm trying really hard to create that world for her right now, but honestly, it's hard. Um, mm. I think that the foods that we eat would also be representative of a greater diversity of cultures that were reflective of the people who surrounded us and the cultures from which they came from. I think I think that I would be spending way more time outside <laughs> yeah. and less time with screens. Yeah, less uh, screen fatigue, Zoom fatigue. Uh, I totally agree with you. These last three questions are for my listeners. They're, um, if there was one message that you could depart to my listeners as a sustainable takeaway that has the power to change their life, what would it be, your message? I have two things. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. Okay. First of all, recognize that you are a part of earth and that you evolve to be a part of earth. Every single thing that you eat came from earth and everything that you waste has an impact on earth, which connects to my second point. If you want to make an impact on the climate crisis, the most important thing you can do is to waste no food. Think about the energy, the time, that people, but also the sun and the soil put into the foods that you are eating. Try to utilize all of it. Think of it as a culinary challenge. And also you're gonna save money. You're gonna eat more nutrients. It is a win, win, win all around. And it is according to Drawdown, the number one thing we can do to combat the climate crisis. And that's not something that corporations are responsible for, it's you. So go out there, find some new recipes, explore your foods, um, buy foods that have the leaves on them, that have the roots on them, use all of it um, and have some really great food adventures and save some money while you're at it. That's perfect. What should young innovators, investigative journalists, reporters, authors, foodies in your field be thinking about if they're looking for ways to make a real impact? I think it really is about how to make sustainable food culture relevant and accessible to all people. Because we're just not gonna get to the end goal if this remains a topic that is mainly targeted at white, Western and wealthy audiences. Everyone has an opportunity to take part. Um, there are affordable, delicious ways to take part, but oftentimes we're not making that terribly apparent to people. We're not really making it super accessible for people. Um, so it doesn't matter in my mind whether you want to do that through synthetic biology or you want to do it through regenerative farming um, or you want to do it through storytelling or, or even an app. Um, if you are going to, to democratize sustainable eating, I think that that is a way to live your life with purpose. I love that. 
What have you experienced or learned in your professional journey so far that you would have loved to know from the start? Oh. I think it's up to each of us to define what success looks like in our careers. And this does go back to meritocracy. Um, I wish I hadn't been so focused on my SAT scores necessarily, and I hadn't been so focused on um, pulling in certain accolades. Um, but then again, I'm very, very fortunate to have support, financial support from, from family to feel like I have uh, people to fall back on. I do have that strong support network. Um, but I really do think that I was raised in a, with a mentality of, you know, seek to do something that's good for yourself instead of what's good for your community. And I am now, just now, starting to feel like I am a part of a community. And it's the most fulfilling time in my career that I've ever had. So I think that if I, I just wish that I had had that message earlier on. Eve, thank you for letting us inside of your ideas. It's been a sheer pleasure. We could talk for hours, but that's all I have. And I really thank you for your time and uh, I wish you a wonderful day. Unless there's anything else you'd like to tell us or we missed, that's it. I'm done. No, thank you, Mark, for these really fantastic questions and for a great, uh, a great conversation. I appreciate it. You're most welcome. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.